Good Monday morning. Pastor Rob here. Time for Coffee with Rob. We finished Mark chapter 1 Friday, and so today we're on Mark chapter 2. This is the healing of the paralytic. It's a great story. So let's go through Mark chapter 2. We'll go verses 1 through 12 if you have your Bible. Uh, Mark chapter 2 verse 1 says, A few days later, and I find that interesting because Throughout this book so far, we've seen that word "utheos" means immediately, immediately. Uh, and here it seems like Mark says, let's slow it down just for a minute. So a few days later, Jesus is in Capernaum, which is kind of his home area. Some people believe that that was his headquarters or that maybe that's where one of the homes of Peter was, where he stayed with Peter. A lot of, a lot of um, theories on that. But anyway, we know that he works out of Capernaum quite a bit. And the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered, there's no room left around inside or outside of the door where he was preaching, the home he was preaching. What was he doing? He was preaching the word. This is what we need so vitally in churches today, is preaching the word. Now, this is a, two things on that. You know, Jesus was popular. He was doing miracles. He was uh, unusual. He, he seemed to give the Jews some hope that they would be out of the oppression of the Roman government. And so he's popular, so people are coming around. But what's he doing? He's not letting this go to his head. This is a good example for all pastors to just preach the word. And people need to come in, hear the word. Churches need the word more than anything. And two, no, two thoughts on that that I had was, uh, it, it says in the last days that people won't put up with sound biblical teaching. And you can see that today. People want um often and, and this is for all of us we need to check ourselves am i there to be entertained am i there to make sure the pastor says what i want to hear am i there to make sure he makes me feel good but if you really want to hear from god and from the pastor who should be hearing from god you should want to have your toes stepped on once in a while uh, we should be going into worship god we should be going into learn the word and sometimes the truth of the word hurts but if you turn to second timothy 3 and chapter four, those two chapters are very uh, kind of um, like parallel what today is. And so in, in 2 Timothy 3, it says there in, in the last days, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. And there's a whole list of things here. They'll have a form of godliness. In other words, they'll be kind of religious. So they'll acknowledge that there's a God. What we see today in Oprah Winfrey is a prime example of this. She believes in all gods. She believes in many ways to heaven. This is that form of uh, godliness. She says, for me, I believe in Jesus Christ, quoting Oprah. I believe in Jesus Christ. He's my way, and I'm a believer. And people cheer on that. But she'll say, but I think there are many other ways. But the Bible is very clear. There's only one way. That's Jesus Christ. You can be religious, and people are very religious, or, or spiritual, or I'll send you good vibes, or positive thoughts. It means nothing. If you aren't praying to Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, then those words are worthless. Maybe a little bit of encouragement, but definitely there's no um, tangible value or power in words of good vibes or I'm spiritual. The only way you're going to have any power is through Jesus Christ. And in last days, it says people won't put up with that. And you see that today. People will talk about anything but Jesus Christ. And if it is about Jesus Christ, then oftentimes they become very critical. So I stay in the Word. Stay close to your God. Don't be distracted. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 4 says again, just like Jesus was doing and Paul writes, uh, preach the word, be prepared in season, out of season. Uh, I think a lot of the things they, in that day when Jesus was preaching, the people were oppressed. There was a depression. There was an, a lot of economy for the Jews. They were not successful. They needed hope. So they came to hear the word. When things are good, people aren't so concerned with the word because pe things are good. And we live amongst the greatest, most educated, most technologically advanced society in all of history. So because things are good, because things are readily available, we think because things come quickly and we have that instant fulfillment, then there's really people don't care so much about Jesus Christ, some people, because everything's there. What do I need him for? I've got everything I need. And so that's what happens, and that's what you see in the last days, is we're, high, we're doing really well. And so, therefore, people don't need Jesus. So the time will come, 2 Timothy 4, 3, when men will not put up with sound doctrine. and said they, instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around a great number of teachers and say, with their itching ears, want to hear. Tell me what I want to hear. Make me feel good. 
uh, or, or I'm not coming. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn to miss things that make them feel good. Well, you challenge me. You convict me when you talk about Jesus Christ. I don't want that. I want to go to a church where I go in and I have my coffee and I hear good music and they tell me, oh, you look so nice. Thank you for coming. Have a positive vibe. Think about it. Pray about it. Name it and it's yours and go home and feel great. No, I want to be challenged. I want to be challenged. Just like in the military, you know, if you're going to basic training, you want to be challenged. Earn the title soldier. Go to ranger school. Earn the title ranger. Airborne school. Earn the title paratrooper. Stuff like that. Of course, my whole life was military now, but where's the pride in not being challenged everybody gets a trophy everybody gets a pat on the back regardless we want to be challenged you as a believer should want to be challenged you want your pastor to challenge you <clears throat> but it says in the last days <clears throat> that people ain't going to put up with it we don't want to hear the truth we just want things that make us feel good and look at the decisions being made today they're made a lot of times based on emotion not on truth and fact so they will turn their way uh, from the truth and turn to myths but you keep your head in all situations, Paul referring to Timothy as he teaches and preaches, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist. So stay true to the word, preach the word. That's what Jesus is doing here in Mark chapter 2, verse 2. He's preaching the word, and people in hard times will listen to the word. <clears throat> so since they could not get to him, so this, some men come bringing a paralytic man, and this is interesting, is that the words here in the Greek mean there was, this man was completely surrounded. He was covered on all sides. We don't know if they were his friends. We assume they were his friends. I don't see anywhere where it says they were his friends. But four men brought this man. It could have been four guys going, hey, man, remember that guy down by the uh, on, on the bed with his paralytic? Let's take him up there and see if Jesus can heal him. Or they could have been friends and could say, hey, let's get our brother up there. And they did everything necessary to get him to Jesus Christ. They even broke through the roof. And the Greek word here is flat roof. And I wrote that down. It's stega. So they got up on a flat roof and they dug through it. They broke through the roof and lowered him down on ropes before Jesus Christ and laid him before him. If you want Jesus, you will do anything that necessary to get there. Unfortunately, in prosperous times, that's not always the case. In desperate times, you know when somebody's dying, when you've lost a job, when you've hit financial hardship, when you have a health issue, you come to Jesus. You'll, you will not be denied. We need that every day, even in successful times. So these men did anything they could, broke down all barriers, broke down all norms, got on the roof, and lowered this man down to Jesus Christ. And I love the fact that Paul, that Mark writes, slowing it down. Let's take a look at this situation. And isn't it nice to have, if they are friends, four good friends that are there beside you to help you? A very fortunate man. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, Jesus is popular, the, the house is full, everywhere around the house is full. Uh, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. After digging through it, they lowered the mat the paralyzed man was on. When Jesus saw their faith, uh, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, here we go. Here's when all the religious people go crazy. And this is one of the things as a pastor, you got to stick to your guns. So if you're a pastor listening, stick to your guns. Some, sometimes it's about the result, not always about how you get there. And I know in the church that oftentimes your people will come at you critically because you don't do, you do things that are not normal. And I'll give you an example. One year we had a VBS at our church and we baptized 22 kids. And then we, we, we filled up a pool at the school and we filled it with water and kids from ages 16 to six. Now the sixth kid was questionable. I admit that. But from 16 to 6, these kids came forward and gave their life to Christ and were baptized on the school grounds at the VBS. And we had a basketball camp. Some people in the church did not like that. When I went to my elders meeting, one of the elders says, I'm not going to approve that report. And I'm like, why is that? We baptized 22 kids. Kids, God did a miracle. This is incredible in this day and age of 22 kids. And I gave a three-day class on baptism. These kids knew what they were doing. But when I went to the elders meeting, one of the elders said, I don't like that. We don't agree with that. We don't like the way you did that. How do you know they got saved? And I said, I don't know that they got saved. If I baptize anybody, I don't know that they got saved. I just know that I, I, in obedience to God as a pastor, did everything I could to get them to Christ. I'll dig through the roof. I'll baptize you in a field. I bat We baptize people in a lake, a hot tub. We don't care as long as they come to Jesus. But that elder refused to acknowledge that report and would not sign into that report. At our elders meeting 22 kids got baptized and he's like not good enough i don't like the way you did it i'm not going to approve it 
Who cares? I don't care. That's on him. But that's the way you got to stand your ground. It's unusual. And not everybody's going to approve what you do. But 22 kids gave their life to Christ. Hallelujah. Well, where are they? They didn't come to church. They did come to church for a few days. But these kids weren't in charge. They're, they're minors. Their parents didn't come to church. But those kids gave their life to Christ. They'll always remember that. So, so uh, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like this? Here comes the criticism. Why does he talk like this? He's blaspheming. Who can, three challenges. Why does he talk like this? Who can forgive sins but God? He's blaspheming. All these things. So pastors, Christian, believer, if you're strong and you stand up and you do something for God, expect criticism. I've always said that. Anytime a church takes a step forward to be more effective for Christ and has an effect for Christ, somebody, even people within the church, are going to challenge your efforts. And I don't know why that is just the way it is. So they challenge them. The religious people show their face. Ah, we don't like the way you did that. We don't like your technique. We don't like the fact that you baptize kids in a school parking lot. And I don't care. I'm going to do what God called me to do. And you shouldn't either. It's going to come. Just be prepared for it. Have thick skin. Keep going forward. So they, the critics come out. We don't like the way you did that. And Matthew 15 is another verse you can read on that if you want to. And the other follow-ups are these are Mark 9, uh, excuse me, Matthew 9 and Luke 5. Those two chapters also expound on this situation. So the critics come out, as, uh, as common does, as Jesus makes a step forward and heals a man. Heals him, forgives his sins, for, heals a man, sees his faith, heals a man. They don't even care about the miracle. They don't care. They're only worried about what happened, how they got there. They're only worried. They didn't even care about the hole in the roof, which blows my mind. They didn't care about the hole in the roof. They're like, we don't like the way you did that. We don't like the way you said that. We don't care about the hole in the roof. We don't care about the miracle. We just don't like the way you went about doing that. That's typical, unfortunately, even today. And then we have Uthios again, Mark chapter 2, verse 8. Immediately, Jesus knew. He knew right away. He has full knowledge. He's God-man. He's the God-man. Perfectly God, perfectly man. Immediately, Jesus knew in the spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? And that's my question to Christians today. Why are you so critical? If somebody's not in an open sin or violating some type of law, what do you care what somebody does that would bring somebody to Jesus Christ? It may take something unusual to get to certain people. I think one of the things, too, that people were critical of is I go to one percent or biker gangs and tell them about Jesus Christ or clubs. Not all them guys are bad guys. They do shady things. But you know what? Some of them are pretty decent dudes. And you'd be surprised. They've even amongst certain one percent or motorcycle clubs. There's Christian in those clubs. They just don't have anything else to do. So they want a brotherhood. So they go there. And honestly, they wouldn't be welcome in a church. And that's a shame. So anyway, I do that. It's unusual. And some people are critical of that. I don't care. Because everybody needs Jesus. So immediately Jesus knew in his spirit what they were thinking. Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier? What does it care? What do you care what I said or what I did? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and take your mat and walk. But here's what he's doing. He's showing them that he has authority over every situation. He has authority over sin. He has authority over this disease. And that's the real takeaway here is that he has the authority over sin, number one. But number two is, hey, man, this guy's walking. He wasn't walking when he came here. What do you care what I said? What do you care about the method? And by the way, who's going to patch the hole in this roof? Why are you yelling at me? Why don't you guys get up there and help these guys patch that roof? Because a miracle was performed here. But they don't do that. They're critical of him. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority. He has authority in the synagogue. He has authority over demons. He has authority over disease. He has authority over sin. He has authority on earth to forgive. And he said to the paralytic, I tell you, I'm going to block these guys out. I don't want to hear the criticism. All I'm worried about, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you walking? Go home. Take up your mat and walk. And that's what he says. I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. And he got up. Hallelujah. And people are down. If you're in sin and you know it, you're down. Isn't it great? Jesus will say, give me your hands. Let me help you up. And people are like, oh my God, I can't believe you're talking to that person. Oh my gosh, who cares? We want to preach the gospel. And I love that. He got up, took his mat, walked out, and few of all of them, this amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. So just a few things. One of them was that I think as a pastor, what I find most often is that when you do something for God, just expect the critics to come out, but you've got to stand your ground. Be true to God. He'll handle the situation. Block out all the critics. 
and go do what you do in the name of Jesus Christ because people need a healing hand. People need Jesus Christ. People need to hear the gospel. And who cares how you get it there? Just get it there so people can hear it and be healed spiritually and even physically. People can come to Christ today and still be healed through prayer. So this man was healed. The critics came out. Jesus went on about his business and did what he does anyway. So that's it for today. Be strong. Be strong in Christ. Preach the word always. Don't compromise. Um, the critics are going to come. Stand strong. And tomorrow we'll get into uh, Mark chapter 2 from 13 on. Have a great day.